Welcome to lecture 13, the line integral. Our title is Integrating Along a Line, Taking the Dot Product of the Field. So let's start by reviewing the integrals that led to an arc length. If you recall the definition of the arc length, when we had a function y equals f of x, what we find is the integral, the arc length, the integral from a to b ds, when we convert it to an integral over x, we have an integral dx, but then we have this extra factor which gives the arc length, the square root of 1 plus df dx quantity squared. And that comes about because what we're interested in is the hypotenuse ds, and that would equal dx squared plus dy squared. Factoring out the dx makes it 1 plus dy dx squared, but y is equal to f of x, and so you get this formula here. We've gone through that in a lecture a couple of, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. All right, so let's now do an integral over a semicircle that has radius r. Here the function f of x is equal to the square root of r squared minus x squared. And then df dx, I can calculate it. I'll get a 1 half uh, times the square root of r squared uh, over the square root of r squared minus x squared. Then it gets multiplied by a minus 2x, and the net is that I get minus x over the square root of r squared minus x squared. Now when I square that and add 1, I get 1 plus x squared divided by r squared minus x squared. And putting everything over the same denominator, I get r squared minus x squared plus x squared. So that just gives r squared in the numerator and the square, and I get a r squared minus x squared in the denominator. Take the square root of the whole thing and I get r divided by the square root of r squared minus x squared. So we plug that into the integral. And we got an integral from minus r to r dx of r over the square root of r squared minus x squared. Now we know how to handle these integrals. We have to do this trig substitution. And the trig substitution is x equals r sine theta. The integral is going to go from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. The dx is going to become dr cos, uh, is going to become r cos theta d theta. And the square root of r squared minus x squared becomes r times the square root of 1 minus sine squared, but the square root of 1 minus sine squared is equal to cosine theta. And so the cosine theta cancels in the numerator and denominator. And I'm left just with an integral d theta of r. And that integral I can do immediately, and I get r times pi. Okay, now we're going to do a similar thing, except we're going to integrate a vector field across the same arc of the semicircle. So what we want to do for this line integral, we have to first define what the function f is, and we have to determine what the unit tangent vector t hat is, because the integral is defined as that vector field dotted into the unit tangent, and then I have to sum that up over each piece of the, of the arc as I move uh, all the way across the arc. So since I'm integrating over the arc length, when I convert from an integral over s to an integral over x, I get an integral dx times the square root of 1 plus df by dx quantity squared. And then I have my vector field f of x dot, dotted into the tangent vector t. Okay, so let's pick the integral to be the same semicircle of radius r. So f of x is r squared minus x squared, the square root of that. Let's pick our vector field to be minus y plus x. If you remember, that's a vector field that has a circulation in the circular direction. It tends to circulate in a counterclockwise direction, whereas our integral is going in a clockwise direction. If we substitute in what y is, we get minus the square root of r squared minus x squared times the unit vector in the x direction plus x times the unit vector in the y direction. So we need to determine the tangent vector. So what's the tangent vector? Well, our curve is x f of x. And so the tangent vector, I have to take the derivative of that. So it's 1 df by dx. Now that isn't a unit vector. I have to normalize it to make it a unit vector. Well, what will I normalize it by? I have to divide by the square root of 1 plus df by dx quantity squared. Now look, that is exactly that extra factor that's in the integral. So the square root of 1 plus df by dx squared is going to cancel in the numerator and denominator, and I can replace square root of 1 plus df by dx squared times t hat by 1 comma df dx, and I can then just take the dot product and evaluate what I'm getting. So now the integral, when I take that dot product, I'm going to get minus y times 1, so that's minus the square root of r squared minus x squared, and I'm going to get plus x times df by dx. 
Well, df by dx, if you remember, was minus x over the square root of r squared minus x squared, and that gets multiplied by x. And so I get this form for the integrand that is shown on the left-hand side. Now we can simplify this if I put everything over the same common denominator. I'm going to get a minus r squared plus an x squared minus an x squared. So that's going to leave me with a minus r squared over the square root of r squared minus x squared. And now we just do our trig substitution that we used before. We let x equal r sine theta. Then dx is equal to r cos theta d theta. My integral is going to go from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. In the numerator now I'm going to have an r squared times an r cos theta. So that becomes r cubed cos theta. The denominator is the same, r times the square root of 1 minus sine squared theta. 1 minus sine squared theta becomes cosine squared theta. I take the square root, it's cosine theta. Those cosine thetas cancel, and I'm left with just an integral from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2 d theta of minus r squared. That integral is easy to do. It gives me, my, it gives me pi, and so I get minus pi times r squared for this line integral. Now the key thing to remember here is the line integral is essentially the same as doing the arc length, except there's an extra term in the integrand. And while that extra term may look like it's a difficult term because it involves vectors and dot products, in the end it ends up just being a scalar function of the coordinate that I'm integrating over. So you just have to carefully take your time and work out exactly what that dot product is. You have to work out what each of the vectors are, take the dot product, work out what that integrand is, and then it just becomes a normal integral. So you just have to evaluate it as a normal integral. So it's not something that you should become afraid of. It's something that you should just take your time, go through all the steps, and then you'll be able to handle line integrals. They're no more difficult than calculating an arc length, and you guys have become experts in doing that with all the practice that you had in the class and in the lectures. Okay, there's one more thing that I want to show you, which is situations where a closed path integral will vanish. So let's consider a vector field that is pointing in the radial direction. So remember, the unit vector in the radial direction can be written as x times the unit vector in the x direction plus y times the unit vector in the y direction plus z times the unit vector in the z direction all divided by r. And let's assume that that vector field only depends on r. It doesn't depend individually on x, y, and z, but only on the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Then when I take an integral from some point 1 to some point 2 of f of r dot t ds, we're going to prove that that only depends on the endpoints 1 and 2. It doesn't depend on the shape of the curve between points 1 and 2. And that's a pretty remarkable result if you think about it. So let's work on the proof. Remember ds, we're working now in three dimensions, so it's dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. The tangent vector is going to be dx by ds times the unit vector in the x direction plus dy by ds times the unit vector in the y direction plus dz by ds times the unit vector in the k direction. That will be a unit vector that is tangential to the curve s. And it's a unit vector because if I calculate the length of it, I'll get a square root of dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared divided by ds squared, the square root of ds squared, so divided by ds. But the square root of dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared is ds, and so I get the same thing in the numerator and in the denominator, and of course that cancels, and that's why t hat is a unit vector. Very important you recognize that that t hat is a unit vector. So let's take the dot product with the vector field. I'm going to get fx of r times dx by ds times ds, and I can replace that by just dx. And similarly, I'll get plus fy of r dy plus fz of r dz. Now, remember, we said that our unit vector pointed in the radial direction. So I can write it as some fu scalar function f of r, little f of r, times the unit vector in the radial direction, r hat. And now when I take that f of r times the unit vector in the r direction, when I work that out, it's going to be just f of r times x over r i hat plus y over r j hat plus z over r k hat. So when I now take the dot product, what I'm going to find is I'm going to get an f of r x over r dx plus y over r dy plus z over r dz. And now when you look carefully at that, you recognize that's actually equal to f of r times dr. How do I determine that? Well, what is Remember, r is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. If I look at d by dx of r, I'm going to get a 1 half. 
I'm going to get 1 over the square root, and I'm going to get a 2x in the numerator. So the 1 half and the 2 cancel, I get x over r. And you can see x over r times dx. So I can write that as dr by dx times dx. But dr by dx times dx is just equal to dr. And similarly, for the y over r dy and the z over r dz, both of those become equal to different pieces of the dr. And when all the dust settles, what you find is this is equal to f of r times dr. And so we now can evaluate the integral. What we find is the integral is equal to an integral from 1 to 2 of f of r dr. That's just a scalar integral, depends on a single variable. And now we bring in the fundamental theorem of calculus. So the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that a definite integral only depends on the endpoints evaluated at the antiderivative. So I have to find the antiderivative of little f of r, and then I evaluate it at point 2 and subtract its value at point 1. It doesn't depend on how I got from point 1 to point 2, just on the points 1 and 2. So that completes the proof. That shows that when I have a vector field that depends only on r and points in the radial direction, then the integral from 1 to 2 of big F of r dot t hat ds only depends on the endpoints 1 and 2. Now we do something that's very clever. If the endpoints are the same, so I integrate around some closed path, then that integral must equal 0 because I'm taking the difference of the antiderivative at the same point. And we call that situation an, a vector field that has no circulation. And so we often write it in this symbol, an integral with a circle around it to indicate I'm going around a closed path, f of r dot t hat ds equals 0. And that is, when that occurs for every closed path, we say that the vector field has no circulation. And that's going to be related to whether or not the vector field has a curl associated with it. And you can see that this is now looking like a pretty remarkable result. What it says is that if I take any closed path and I integrate this vector field times the tangent vector across that path, I'm guaranteed to get zero. That's a pretty remarkable result, and it follows from this proof. So please take the time to carefully go through the proof. The hardest part is understanding how we convert finally to little f of r dr, but you can sort that out simply by looking at what happens if I look at the different components of dr, thinking of it as a total derivative with respect to the partial derivatives with respect to x, y, and z, and you should be able to convince yourself about that uh, connection between the two. And this result is a very important result. It allows us to determine a whole bunch of interesting things about the vector fields and about their integrals simply because they have no circulation. So I hope that you can take the time to fully understand this proof, and we're going to be applying it in a number of different cases later in the class.